Okay, today's presentation, we're going to be comparing the different I.O. form factors, uh, both rack-based and distributed I.O. Our agenda, of course, will be to take a look at I.O. as part of a system and how it works uh, with the PLC. Uh, we will be taking a look at both rack-based or chassis I.O. and how it works with the PLC, and then uh, dovetailing that with a brief discussion on distributed I.O. We will follow that with a couple of case studies for some common automation applications, and then wrap up the presentation with a brief Q&A section. Okay, when we're thinking about I.O., we, of course, have to start with the PLC. Um, in a classic PLC, uh, we have uh, the, both the chassis and controller construction. You know, PLCs were developed back in the 70s around both the controller and the chassis as your main platform. Um, in this type of setup, you have input and output devices that would plug into that chassis or into that rack. Um, if I needed to add DC inputs, I would add a DC input card. If I needed to add AC outputs, I would add an AC output card. So I would just pick and choose what I needed for my system. Um, and that backplane would provide communication between the controller and the input and output devices. Um, as more and more items were added to the PLC and people were automating more and more parts of their system, manufacturers needed to make larger and larger PLC chassis to accommodate that and develop expansion racks to accommodate the ever-increasing variety and scale of I.O. Because we were no longer just talking about input and output, we're talking about counters, temperature sensors, so on and so forth. So as we need to add more and more features, as you can see, the systems would start to get a little unwieldy. In the early 90s, uh, industrial networks uh, were, were adopted as part of the PLC system. And these networks provided another way of adding I.O. to your system. The adoption of these industrial networks for PLCs led to an evolution in I.O. development. Um, the networks allowed I.O. expansion through the network connection. And this freed users from some of the inherent limitations of the PLC chassis, which obviously was how much I.O. you could add to your system. Uh, with this, distributed I.O. solutions started pro to proliferate. Uh, no longer were you beholden to that particular manufacturer of PLC for selecting the I.O. or the I.O. types that you could get to work with that particular system as third parties started to develop options for you as an integrator. And along with this, integrators are now able to scale a single I.O. solution across a wide range of PLC families. What this means is you could pick, say, your distributed I.O. solution, the type of inputs, the type of outputs, the type of specialty solutions you wanted from one particular distributed I.O. panel and supplier and use that with different manufacturers' PLCs or scale of PLC, whether it was a PLC or PAC, you could now standardize on one particular I.O. And the types of networks that were available and these types of systems are available for include the wide range of industrial networks that are common today, which include Ethernet IP, Profinet, Profibus, Modbus, both Modbus TCP and Modbus RTU, and DeviceNet. Now, when we think about chassis-based I.O. or rack-based I.O., and we think about when we're selecting which one we want to use, some of the benefits of using the chassis-based solution, of course, is it's controller-specific, meaning when I plug that particular card into the PLC, I know it's going to function uh, because that manufacturer, that card has bought a chipset or communication chip specific to that particular chassis, that particular backplane, that particular controller. The chassis-based solution also centralizes the control. Everything is in one panel, everything is in one rack. Uh, making it a little bit easier to troubleshoot, wire, and locate everything that's going with my system. I have direct backplane communication to the PLC, which means I have the fastest update to that PLC. Uh, 
in this case, we're talking in some PLCs today, we can get below the one millisecond uh, rate between communication between a PLC module and the PLC controller. Some considerations, obviously uh, limited expansion ports. If I buy a PLC rack that's only a seven or slot rack, I can only add seven I.O. modules to that system. So I need to consider that when I'm developing my overall control. Product availability. Some of the specialty I.O. solutions that we're looking for may or may not be available for that particular PLC. And power consumption. Uh, some of these plug-in cards can get pretty power hungry, and when you purchase the power supply for that particular PLC rack, and that power supply is providing the power for all the plug-in cards, we need to be aware of that so we don't have situations where uh, we're drawing more power than the power supply can provide, which can cause issues with communication with the backplane and the module. And also cabling. Um, although everything is centralized, that now means I need to run cable complete from that sensor all the way over to the PLC. And if that piece of equipment is rather large, you know, we could be looking at three or 400 feet of cable from one sensor to the controller. Now, when we think about using distributed I.O. for our PLC system, some of the benefits are uh, we can either mount that in the cabinet or on machine. Uh, providers are now supplying I.O. that can be directly mounted on the machine and even in hazardous environments, which makes that very convenient. Um, it decentralizes the system, so I can now locate my I.O. closer to that part of the machine uh, where I need to uh, have that sensor mounted, which reduces wiring. Uh, they're available with many of the common industrial networks, as I stated earlier. And in some cases, they're much more scalable. I'm not limited to a rack construction, so I can expand further and further out uh, as I need I.O. And I can get a much larger product offering because now I'm not just limited to what that PLC supplier offers. I can now look at some of the specialty I.O. products from other suppliers that only work in a network capacity. Some of the considerations are update to the PLC. Uh, because I am going through a network connection, uh, there are some network connection and communication limitations that I need to be aware of. So uh, if I have very high speed functions, high speed inputs or very high speed outputs that I need to uh, monitor or control, I may want to make sure I put that as part of my PLC rack and not part of a distributed I.O. solution. PLC programming may pose a challenge. Because I'm using a distributed solution that works with multiple types of PLC and multiple programming languages, it may not be customized for what I'm used to. So it may be a little bit of a learning curve when using a new distributed system with my PLC. And network availability. Depending upon the distributed I.O. supplier, they may not communicate with all those networks that we discussed earlier, so that's just something we need to consider. Our first application we're going to look at is a position feedback application. As you can see here in the image, we have uh, a gantry that has both an X and Y that we need to monitor and a Z, app, a Z axis that we want to monitor as well. So we want to get four sensors back to the PLC. That PLC is a control logics PLC and those encoders output SSI feedback. So what we're going to select here is we're going to select for this particular application an SSI interface that plugs directly into that control logics PLC. Uh, the reason why we went this route as opposed to a distributed solution uh, is because this module can provide a high channel count. It can interface all four of those sensors into one plug-in card. And because we had rack space available, there was no issue there. And because of the high density of the module, it does provide an overall cost savings over, say, using a distributed solution like a point I.O. and having to use four individual SSI interfaces on that point I.O. So instead of buying four components, we're only buying one. Our second case study in this application, we're doing automated guide adjustment. Uh, we're removing the air adjustment that you see here 
in the image, and we want to use stepper motors. In this case, to accomplish this, we're going to need to interface four stepper motors to this system. The PLC that we're using is a GE RX3i solution, and because we want to try and save money for this application, because it's such a very simple application, is we want to integrate drive and control into one component if possible. For this, we've selected the AMCI ANG1 and ANG1 distributed I.O. The reason why we went this route is because with the RX3i, there is no stepper motion solution available as a plug-in card. So if we want to use the RX3i, we need to go to a distributed solution. Uh, the ANG1 and ANG1 do combine the drive and control into one package, which helps reduce system cost. And because the uh, ANG1 and ANG1 are available in multiple network protocols, because I've done this one one solution, I now have the knowledge to transfer this application to multiple PLC brands. And the ANG1 and ANG1 make it easy to expand for multiple access. Because it's a distributed solution, if I want to add an axis, I just connect one back to this network node, and I now can add another axis of stepper control. Okay, before we enter the Q&A section, I thought we would talk briefly just about some of the new modules AMCI has offers uh, as both distributed and plug-in solutions. We now offer a PWM module or pulse with modulated module for point IO, which is a fantastic solution for controlling proportional control valves. Uh, we have a high speed analog input module for control logics, which is great for data acquisition applications. And on our AnyNet IO, similar to the ANG1 and ANG1 we talked about in the last slide, we now have a PTO or pulse train output motion controller. Okay, uh, that wraps up today's presentation. So if anyone has any questions, I'd like to answer them right now if you have them. Matt, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, yep. Um, the PTO option you just talked about at the end, I'm not, Totally familiar with that. Can you give me like a 30 second application? Yeah. Um, if you're familiar with some of the other modules that we make, say like a plug in card with the PTO, say our 3601 plug in card that would go into a rack, this is basically taking that rack based solution and putting it as part of our AnyNet IO, more or less expanding that family. You know, because as, as we saw in that case study, you know, some PLCs just don't have a PTO solution, so this would allow for that PTO solution. So instead of using a drive controller, maybe that customer had a stepper motor and drive that was on there that he wanted to leave in place, but just needed a step and direction control. So he okay. would use that PTO controller for that step and direction for that particular stepper drive and control application. All right, I get it now. Thanks, thanks much, Matt. Yeah, no problem. All right, hearing no other questions, I'll let everyone get off to their busy days, and everyone have a great weekend. Thanks, Matt. You too. You too, Matt. You Thanks as well, Matt. Matt.